Um, hello and welcome to the first uh, webinar for 2021. It's a joint venture between the Australian Institute of Physics and it's coordinated by the Fleet Centre of Excellence and Fleet stands for Future Low Energy Electronics Te Technologies. And so this is a webinar series fe featuring different centres of excellence around Australia, what we do, the research that we're doing, and keeping you all up to date. My name's Ingrid McCarthy, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Astro 3D, which is the centre of excellence for all sky astrophysics in three dimensions. And I'll be the moderator today. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd firstly like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. Uh, in the case here, we're based at Mount Stromlo, the Ngunnawal people and the Lungawa clan of Malonglo area. And due to ancestral custodians on the lands wherever you might be today, all over Australia and maybe overseas. As we share our knowledge, teaching and research practices, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and tradition of these custodians. Now, today's talk's by Professor Lisa Cooley. Uh, Lisa is a professor and an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the Australian National University in Canberra. And she's also the director of Astro 3D. So a little bit about Lisa and why she's giving this talk and why she's our director. Uh, she obtained her PhD researching the connection between star formation and supermassive black holes in infrared galaxies back in 2002 from ANU. Lisa received the Centre for Astrophysics Fellowship from the Harvard Smithsonian Centre for Astrophysics and there she worked on star formation and chemical properties of nearby galaxies. And then in 2004, she received a NASA Hubble Fellowship, which took her to the University of Hawaii. There, Lisa used the Keck and the Subaru telescopes on Mauna Kea to understand star formation and chemical abundances in galaxies in the distant universe. Now, the really um, key thing that Lisa has done and established herself as a world leader is combining theoretical modelling and simulations with observations of star-forming and active galaxies, which hadn't really been done before. Her contributions include understanding the gas physics in star-forming galaxies and understanding galaxies containing actively accreting supermassive black holes and tracing the star formation and oxygen history of galaxies over the last 12 billion years. Her most recent research combines stellar evolution and photoionisation models with 3D integral field spectroscopy to help understand the physical processes that transform galaxies. And she's going to tell you much more about that um, in her talk so that, that that all makes sense. Last year, Lisa was awarded the US National Academy of Science James Craig Watson Medal. And she was the first Australian to win this major US science award in its 133 year history. A little bit about Astro 3D. Um, Astro 3D unifies over 250 world leading astronomers to understand the evolution of the matter, light and elements from the Big Bang right through to the present day. Researchers are combining Australian innovative 3D optical and radio technology with new theoretical supercomputer simulations on a massive scale requiring big new data techniques. In addition, through our nationwide training and education programs, we're training young scientific leaders and also inspiring high school students into STEM careers to prepare Australia for the next generation of telescopes, the Square Kilometre Array and the extremely large optical telescopes. In terms of today, we will have a Q&A session at the end with Lisa. And so feel free to enter your questions at any stage through the talk as they pop up into the Q&A window and we'll make sure that we go through all of those at the end of the talk. And so without further ado, welcome Lisa. Thanks Ingrid. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick rundown of um, my talk today. Uh, first I'll give an introduction into Astro 3D and our science goals and uh, talk about the telescopes and the instruments that we're using around the world to reach these goals. Um, I'll talk about our discovery highlights of the centre. We're actually halfway through the centre now, so uh, we have a lot of uh, discoveries and we've also achieved some major milestones within our centre. And um, one of the 
targets of our centre is actually in diversity. We have very ambitious diversity targets. So I'm going to talk about how we're achieving these targets and also how we're helping Australia achieve its diversity targets in astronomy. Um, this is outside the centre. And then finally, I'll talk about the national benefit of the centre in uh, as, as astronomers. And um, there's multiple ways how our centre benefits Australia nationally. Okay, so first, an introduction into Astro 3D. So we're a $40 million um, centre of excellence and we span the years 2017 to 2024. Uh, we've got three main science goals. And the first science goal is to understand the th what are the sources of reionization. So the universe entered a dark period after the Big Bang where um, the, there were no stars and we call it the dark ages and it was basically just mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium. And then uh, at some point after the Big Bang, the first stars began forming and they ionised the universe. And now the universe is 99% ionised. So we're trying to understand what first ionised the universe. What, how did it look like? What did it look like? And then how did those ionising sources, could be stars, could be black holes, how did they evolve across cosmic time? We're also trying to understand the build-up of, of matter into galaxies. So how did galaxies form and evolve? And specifically, we're looking at the mass and the angular momentum in galaxies. And then we're trying to understand how the chemical elements uh, that we're made of and the other chemical elements, um, how did they proliferate across the universe? So how did they form and evolve? So our centre is really based on the origins, our astrophysical origins. So um, the centre is also aimed to bridge a big gap in Australian astronomy. So right now we have uh, telescopes that are about in optical about 8 to 10 metres across in size and in the next uh, few years we're currently actually building these telescopes but they'll become operational um, later on in the 2020s and Australia has a partnership in the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is going to be uh, a massive telescope it's being built in Chile at the moment. And we're also, as um, you'll no doubt be aware, we're also a partner in the Square Kilometre Array and the high frequency part of the Square Kilometre Array is being built in Western Australia. And so what we really need to do, because these are major international collaborations, we actually need to train our astronomers and our young astronomers so to lead the discoveries on these telescopes within on telescopes that are going to have uh, many international partners that are also going to have access. So we actually need to be really, really competitive on these telescopes, even though we have a share. And so this is one of the main goals for the centre. Uh, we also, at the time the centre was um, launched in, at almost the same uh, week or, or a couple of weeks, we also became a partner in the European Southern Observatory, uh, which suddenly gave us access to a much larger range of telescopes than we had previously and really put us on the map uh, in optical astronomy. And so it means that we have access to 3D instruments um, now on these very large telescopes and uh, this has been, we felt really like kids in a candy shop and these are my kids in, in a candy shop. And so this uh, led to us having a fantastic amount of ideas across the whole centre uh, for new surveys and projects and I'm going to um, share some of those with you today. So the centre, um, it covers... Uh, six Australian nodes, although we're currently in the process of adding three more nodes. We're hoping to get ARC approval at any day now for our three new nodes in Australia. And then we have um, two other Australian partners, CSIRO, and um, that runs a radio telescopes in Australia, as well as NCI, which is Australia's supercomputing facility, national supercomputing facility. And then we have a range of international partnerships as well. And a lot of these international partnerships are focused on specific expertise, but also access to Northern Hemisphere telescopes and supercomputing facilities. So I'm going to now talk about the science in Astro 3D, so just a brief history of the universe. So after the Big Bang, we had a period, um, which I mentioned, called the Dark Ages, uh, where the neutral hydrogen basically just expanded in darkness. And then over time, clumps of this neutral hydrogen form together, and once uh, gas gets dense enough, then they're able to, it's able to collapse and form stars. So that happened in the very um, earliest times in the universe, about 400 million years after the Big Bang, those first stars were forming. 
And then after that, the gas and the universe collided together and collided together, formed small galaxies, formed bigger galaxies. And so over the, the subsequent, you know, 13 and a half billion years, we're able to produce galaxies like we have, like our own Milky Way in the um, modern day universe. And so we're really trying to understand this whole period from the first stars right up to the present day. So we're covering about 13 and a half billion years of cosmic time. Okay, so the first goal of the centre is to understand this epoch of reionization. And so this period, this is a, uh, just a, a simple 2D image of what we think the epoch of reionization might have looked like where the first stars were forming. But one of the main goals of the centre is to actually look at this in 3D. And uh, so first what we're doing is we're using the Murchison Wide Field Array, which is a square kilometre array pathfinder telescope in Western Australian desert. And we're using that to try to detect the epoch of reionization. This uh, image here shows you what we think it might look like. These are based on supercomputing simulations, and but it's never been detected. And it, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. We're actually looking back through 13 billion years of, of dust and gas and galaxies and for a tiny, tiny little signal. And so we actually need many, many years worth of data uh, in order to, we think, detect what we is like detecting a needle in a haystack. We're trying to do it uh, in 3D, and the square kilometre array will allow us to do this in 3D. Uh, this data cube is based on theoretical simulations by researchers at University of Melbourne in the centre. And this, the red is the neutral hydrogen in the gas, and you can see spheres forming, and it looks a bit like Swiss cheese, and those are the from the stars which are ionising the surrounding material. So the universe goes from, from completely opaque here where you, you can just see all red, all gas. It goes through a period of time, uh, some hundreds of millions of years, where it, it looks uh, kind of like Swiss cheese and it's very lumpy and bumpy. And then uh, slowly as the gas becomes ionised, we're able to see through it and becomes opaque. And now we can see all of the stars in the early universe in this simulation. So we're trying to detect this epoch of realisation. And then with the square kilometre array, we want to image it in 3D like this to compare with our um, theoretical predictions. Now, we're also tracking those ionising sources, so tracking the stars and tracking the um, black holes across cosmic time. And we're using telescopes like the SkyMapper, oops, the SkyMapper telescope at the Siding Springs Observatory in Coonabarabran. And with SkyMapper, we're discovering the oldest stars in the universe. We're using the Milky Way to do this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in my talk. Um, we're currently discovering the first galaxy candidates, so candidates of the first galaxies in the universe using the Hubble Space Telescope. And with luck, this year or next year, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next generation Hubble, is going to launch. And we are involved in the first generation of surveys to be done with that telescope. And we're going to be looking uh, for the first galaxies in the universe. And uh, in the intermediate distance between the first galaxies and our own Milky Way, we're looking at galaxies and how they evolve. And we're doing that using the Keck and the Very Large Telescope on Chile and uh, Keck's in Hawaii and as well as the Anglo-Australian Telescope for the more nearby galaxies. The second goal of the centre is to understand how matter accumulates in the universe into galaxies. So these are Hubble Space Telescope images of galaxies and the top right images here show galaxies seven to eight billion years ago. So we're looking back in time in astrophysics because that's how long the light takes to reach us. So it took seven to 10 billion years for this light from these galaxies to reach us. So these are very young galaxies and you can see they're kind of clumpy and lumpy. They don't look like uh, galaxies that we have around us today, like our own Milky Way, which are much more diffuse. So we're trying to understand how the galaxies, uh, how the material in the galaxies accumulated to form galaxies like our own Milky Way. And so to do this, we need 3D. So that's why we're called Astro 3D. We're trying to understand the evolution of uh, the universe in three dimensions. 
And in particular, we need to track um, the motions of objects over time. So the bottom plot here shows your spectrum. This is a typical spectrum of a nearby star forming galaxy. And the different lines are from different elements. So the red, the red strong line down here is hydrogen. We have a nitrogen line, we've got two sulfur lines. In the blue here, we've got oxygen, two oxygen lines and a hydrogen line. And down in the purple here, we have another oxygen line. So these allow us to determine the chemical elements, but also uh, when things in the universe are moving away from us, uh, they it's the Doppler shifting effect and they become red shifted. And so all these lines actually become shifted towards the red. If it's moving towards us, they're shifted towards the blue. And what this means is that we can get a velocity map and so we can actually see how the galaxies are moving uh, in, in terms of space. So we can see how they're rotating and how the gas in the galaxies, whether it's flowing in or out. And so we're actually using these um, neat 3D instruments and Australia is a world expert in building 3D instruments to make data cubes. And the way we do this, we actually are taking an image and then for every pixel on the image, we have a spectrum. And so we actually have a 3D data cube, which allows us to figure out where the mass, the ionisation and the elements are in the galaxy using these lines, as well as uh, its motions by using the redshift. And um, now to do this in the distant universe is actually really hard because distant galaxies are tiny and they're faint. And so we're using a clever technique called gravitational lensing. This is a well-known technique. It was actually uh, suggested by Einstein that the largest objects in the universe are lensing the light so you have from a background galaxy now and they'll actually um, it's like a big magnifying glass in the universe and so the mass in these massive galaxy clusters is so big that the, it actually attracts the light and it, it turns it like this like a magnifying glass turns out this magnifies galaxy light by about 10 to 30 times and not just in you know in brightness but also on the on in size and so galaxies look bigger and what this means is that galaxies uh, you know maybe 12 billion years ago look as big um, and we can get as much resolution with the world's largest telescopes and special adaptive optics techniques as we get using our smaller ground-based telescopes uh, such as the uh, sighting springs um, telescopes and sighting springs so this means we can actually compare galaxies across a large distance in cosmic time over about 12 billion years. And um, finally, the third goal of the centre is to understand our origins. So we're trying to understand how the chemical elements formed and evolved in galaxies across time. They're formed in stars and then they're, um, they're thrown out of stars through supernova and stellar winds and then we can actually detect them in the surrounding gas in galaxies using spectroscopy. And so we're using actually the same instruments and the same telescopes using uh, cleverly designed observations uh, to detect the different elements in the objects in the universe and including the SkyMapper telescope where we're looking for the oldest stars in the universe uh, that are in the Milky Way. We think some of the stars in the Milky Way may have been the first stars in the universe. And so far we've discovered the three oldest stars in the universe including this star here, which is 13.6 billion years old. And so we think that these earlier stars maybe only had one supernova before them. They're very, they're very, very young. And so just to go into more detail about this SkyMapper telescope, so SkyMapper is out at Siding Springs and it takes an image uh, every night of the whole southern sky in multiple bands. And so using that, we find targets, um, so candidates for the most pristine stars. And then we observe them on the very large telescope in Chile. And this is a spectrum from one of these older stars here. And these lines are from different chemical elements. And we can tell looking at the strengths of these lines, um, how pristine the star is. Uh, and finally, one, our, one of our goals of the centre is to compare the history of other galaxies that look like our Milky Way to our own Milky Way. So we're doing a project in our own Milky Way called Galactic Archaeology. And in Galactic Archaeology, we're trying to reveal the history of the Milky Way. And we're doing this using a couple of uh, telescopes. We're using the Gaia telescope, which is a space telescope. And then we're combining Gaia data with the um, Hermes instrument on the Anglo-Australian telescope in Coonabarabran. And the combination of these two telescopes allows us to determine the age and the amount of chemical elements of stars in the Milky Way. 
And um, theorists predict that if we can determine the age and the chemical elements of a million stars in the Milky Way, then we should be able to backtrack the history of the Milky Way because stars with the same age and the same chemistry formed together, but they have moved over time. And so if we can find these stars that would have been siblings, that our siblings would have been born together, then we can actually take the Milky Way map and then actually look back in time as to what the history of the Milky Way was. And I'm going to show you some exciting results from that in this talk. So we're combining radio surveys, optical surveys, and theoretical uh, simulations to try to understand galaxy formation and evolution and the first stars uh, in the universe. And we need to do that because we're trying to understand um, how mass built up in galaxies. And matter is, is not simple. It's actually in lots of phases. We've got dark matter, we've got cold gas, we've got hot gas, and we've got stars. Now, the radio traces the cold gas. Uh, we can see the hot gas and the stars in the optical, and then we need theory to tell us where the dark matter is. And um, so we and we need to do this with massive galaxy data sets, hundreds and thousands of galaxies. And so that's what we're doing within the centre. Um, so to go, to combine it all together, we have a big theory program, and this is the first theory program. Uh, in the world which is specifically designed for our surveys and including making mock observables for our surveys. So the simulations start with the first stars predicting the epoch of reionization and then they evolve those um, the first stars and then the galaxies right through to our own Milky Way producing galaxies. These are simulated galaxies here. They look rather like galaxies in our own um, local universe, and then we we create 3D data sets uh, for comparison with our radio and optical surveys. Okay, so some highlights of those um, exciting science programs. Uh, so the Murchison Wide Field Array aims to detect the epoch of reionization, and we have to remove the noise. There's a huge amount of noise. There's noise from other galaxies. There's noise from our own atmosphere. There's noise from our own Milky Way. In fact, our Milky Way produces a huge amount of noise if we're trying to look outside our Milky Way. And so the MWA astronomers, and this is Ben McKinley, he's an Astro 3D postdoc at Curtin University, he used the moon to measure the average brightness of the Milky Way, so it reflected off the moon. So the brightness of the Milky Way reflected off the moon um, to help remove that foreground noise from the Milky Way uh, in the search for uh, the epoch of reionization. Another highlight is that uh, Nicole Barry and the Epoch of Reionization team, uh, University of Melbourne and uh, Curtin University, they improved our ability to detect the epoch of reionization by a factor of 10. So this is a major improvement. And so we're, you know, well on our way to do that detection. Now, Thomas Nordland has been looking at the first stars in the universe and uh, looking at candidates for those. And he discovered the most iron poor star known. He's a very lucky postdoc. He, this is his first observing run. And he went and observed and found the, the most iron poor star in the universe. And uh, I liked the press release for this anemic star carries the mark of its ancient ancestor. The galaxy evolution programs using that gravitational lensing technique to discover distant galaxies and to try to understand how they formed and evolve. And Chen Chen Yuan is an Astro 3D fellow at Swinburne University. And she used this lensing technique to discover the most distant spiral galaxies. And so here are the images of these distant spiral galaxies, and these are um, many billion years ago that the light was emitted. And here you can see the spiral arms, and these provide really important tests for our models of galaxy spiral galaxy formation because many models actually predicted that spiral arms formed later than these galaxies are. So um, really interesting results there. Another survey highlight. Now, one of the main advantages of the survey of Astro 3D and all centres of excellence is that they allow um, collaborations across different science areas as well as across different universities, and they're meant to facilitate these. And this is a really um, excellent example of this. Uh, in our centre, we have Astro 3D fellows, and so we have one fellow um, 
usually one fellow at one time at each university in the centre and they they typically cover different science areas and um, they can do their own research. They're independent fellows. And uh, so our, our fellows got together and decided that they wanted to do a project together which utilises all of their expertise. Um, Caroline Foster here at Sydney, um, she does nearby galaxies and um, 3D survey understanding 3D observations on nearby galaxies. Trevor does old galaxies in the distant universe. Claudia is a theorist and she does galaxy formation evolution models. Elizabeth does radio observations as well as um, theoretical modelling of the spectra of galaxies across uh, cosmic time. And Emily does um, galaxies and their motions uh, in, in particularly uh, star-forming galaxies in the distant universe. And Chen Chen Yuan, as, as you just saw, uh, does um, spiral galaxies using gravitational lensing. So they all do different things, but they all got together and proposed uh, for an instrument called MUSE on the Very Large Telescope, and they were awarded 200 hours. This is actually the largest amount of time um, or ever ob obtained on the ESO MUSE instrument. So this is a fantastic success story for the Astro 3D fellows. Our Galar survey, our Galactic Archaeology survey, reached its halfway mark uh, recently with the public release of um, 500,000 stars. So it's an enormous um, milestone and we're looking forward to reaching a million and then tracking back the history of the Milky Way. The Galar team also used the Hubble Space Telescope data to show that a massive flare was produced by the supermassive black hole in our Milky Way. You might have seen a press release about this because it got a lot of media attention. And uh, so we think the impact of this flare was felt 200,000 light years away and we did this by um, combining uh, observations from a range of different instruments including um, space telescope, ROSAT is an X-ray telescope as well as radio as well as optical. So we used a combination of, of um, a whole bunch of different wavelengths to try to understand the Milky Way flare. And the Galactic Archaeology team also discovered that the, there's two outlying groups of stars which are actually above and below the Milky Way and that they really closely match the stars in our own galaxy. So we think they've been thrown out by a past interaction or collision with a dwarf galaxy. They're the remnants of this collision. And this is done by Luca Crassagrande, who's an associate investigator at ANU. And very recently, this is half the press. This was um, just a couple of days ago. The press release went out. Uh, Anshu Gupta, who's an Astro 3D postdoc at uh, University of New South Wales, she has been looking at galaxies at cosmic noon. So cosmic noon is a period in the universe. Um, it's a it's a period when stars were were having a, a lot of star formation, and so we tr she was trying to understand what happens in these galaxies at cosmic noon. And what she found was that at cosmic noon, the galaxies that are fairly normal, they star formation shuts off really quickly. And this is due to um, the supermassive black holes in the galaxies blows out, blows out a huge amount of radiation and material and it stops star forming formation. However, in extended puffy galaxies, this actually is delayed for a long time and we can still see these galaxies nearby. And she used a combination of gravitational lensing surveys as well as a, some theoretical simulations to demonstrate that. And then very recently also this week, a press release gone out that the SAMI survey has completed. So this is a survey of 3D observations of 3,000 galaxies in the nearby southern sky. And um, this allows us to understand how galaxies, in particular their mass and angular momentum, built up. Um, and we, it's uh, dramatically changed our understanding of the um, velocities and how galaxies move in the universe. This is an example. These are all the galaxies, actually, in the SAMI survey and shows uh, they cover a very large range in mass and in local density, so the density that the galaxies are sitting in. And this allows us to understand very well the, the modern-day universe. And we obtain data cubes like this for all of these galaxies. And finally, um, I'm going to have... 
quickly talk about the achieving our diversity targets in the centre and then also the national benefit of the centre. So we've got very ambitious diversity targets. Um, we decided at the beginning of the centre we wanted to achieve 50-50 women at all levels in Astro 3D by the end of 2021. That's this year, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, we also wanted 50% women um, on the science organising committee and invited and contributed speakers at all workshops and conferences. We actually made that a requirement, so that's been happening since the beginning of the centre and 50% women nominations for awards and prizes. Now, it's not enough just to hire 50-50 women. We're actually trying to achieve 50-50 women at all levels. Uh, so that's within all levels within the centre. It's not just the postdocs that we're hiring. And retention is key as well. And so we need to, you know, work on the culture within astronomy, and that's what we've been doing as well. So uh, we offer childcare at all events, um, travel support for children and carers to accompany their um, their parents to conferences, uh, obviously not this year or last year because we didn't do much travel, but normally we have core meeting times 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So that what that means realistically for us, we've got um, universities all across Australia, including Western Australia and Sydney, and so it means that um, all of our main centre meetings happen between uh, about 12 and 2 p.m. on the East Coast to ensure that the West Coast people can attend and still uh, pick up and drop off children. We have diversity training for all members. We've got a range of diversity training that we do, not just gender but um, wider forms of diversity, including LGBTI ally training. And this year we're going to be doing cultural um, diversity training as well. We offer mentoring circles, and this is really important um, in a centre where we. We started off with having a much larger fraction of men at the higher levels um, than at the lower levels, and so we didn't have so many women to be one-on-one -on -one mentors for the junior women. And so we introduced mentoring circles, which had been shown to work quite well in business and industry, where you've got one mentor and maybe five or six mentees, and this means that the um, people in minorities don't get overburdened with mentoring activities. We have, we're have we offering women-only permanent positions. In fact, we're advertising one at the moment at University of Sydney, and we've already completed women-only hires at University of Melbourne and Western Australia, and um, at the Australian National University, we did one-to-one, uh, -one, so uh, women and a man hire. All jobs are available in the centre part-time and um, people are taking us up on that and um, we've had, you know, great success in part-time uh, jobs, including at the chief investigator level. I'm going to show you some results from our gender modelling and um, we also do women's advancement and specific women leadership programs as well. Okay, so we have a top-down approach to achieving our diversity targets, and that starts off with our, at our executive management committee and even our advisory board. Um, so the executive management committee of the centre is responsible for the oversight of the centre, so there's budget, personnel, management, you know, hiring and retention, strategic planning, as well as the centre programs. And so you can see here, this is based on the node leaders mostly, as well as Ingrid as COO and the collaboration leader and um, diversity and inclusion lead. We also have postdoc and student reps, which al alternate each month. But you can see here we've already got 50-50, and I think this is really critical. If you want to achieve 50-50, it needs to be top down. You've got to make sure all your visible and all of your committees, in fact, but especially the ones that are responsible for the oversight and the management, they've got to be 50-50. And so this is where we are so far. So we actually built up in critical mass in the centre. We've been increasing um, significantly since we started. So in 2017, we started with around 140 investigators and now, oops, now we're close to 250 investigators. And most of that critical mass build up has been in, this, in students as well as in postdocs. It's not so much in our AIs and affiliates or our CIs, although we have had rotations in our CIs as well. <clears throat> and this plot on the right shows you at the fraction of women in our centre and how it's changed at each level with time. So we've, we've all, and the target of 50% is shown in red. And you can see we're, um, we're, we're close to achieving our 50% target in our affiliates, our postdocs, 
as well as in our chief investigators here. And where we need to work is in the student pool. And we're, un unfortunately, in Australia, we're not responsible for our student selection. Um, that's done at a college level based on, um, you know, grades. And uh, then their students are awarded a postgraduate, federal postgraduate award scholarships or international scholarships. And it's clear that this hasn't been producing um, 50 50 diversity in the PhD student pool. And so we're, we're going to approach the universities about how we can achieve better diversity within our student pool. Also, our partner investigators, these are mostly people overseas. And so we have been limited by their diversity. So people who need to, who can be partner investigators, need to be fairly senior. And um, so we started off with 20. 25% and uh, we're still hovering around 25%. Um, we had a change where the, the, we had some partner investigators at the Anglo-Australian Observatory. They moved into the university sector and so they then, some of those became um, affiliates and soon to become chief investigators as well. Okay, so um, we also need to help Australia achieve you know, better diversity because we're drawing from the Australian pool as well as the international pool, but it's really important as a centre that we have broader impact um, outside the centre. And this is one of the things we're aiming to achieve in the centre as well. Um, so first what I did was I looked at all the astronomer institutions. So these are all universities or organisations in Australia that have astronomers. And there's, so there's 17 of them in Australia. And so I asked them, um, I did a survey and what initiatives have they introduced in the past seven years? And so the fraction of uptake of these initiatives, so these include family-friendly hours, um, mentoring of women for promotion, monitoring speaker diversity, so colloquium, speaker diversity, carers, funds and climate surveys and so on, is, is really large and this has all happened in the past seven years. So there's been a dramatic change in these. Uh, and most, so most institutions now would have an equity and diversity committee and policies. Uh, they do climate surveys, they have a carer fund and things like a lactation room and family-friendly meeting hours. So this is really great to see. Now, has it impacted the fraction of men and women in astronomy is a real question and the answer is no, uh, not yet anyway. Uh, so this is the fraction of men and women in astronomy. Uh, the Orange shows the women and the blue shows the men. And the decadal plan uh, in Australian astronomy had a target of 33% women by um, 2025. And so the question is really, are we going to achieve that, that 33% target, and could we achieve 50%? And so I had a look at this, uh, what's happening in Australian astronomy and this is called a, I call this a pipeline stress plot. You look at the change in the change in numbers in cohorts at different level transitions, and this is it for astronomy. This is the change in uh, the cohort numbers from level A to B for men and women, and level B to C, C to D, level D to E. What this is showing is that there's a huge um, departure rate of women relative to the numbers in their cohort well, compared to men at level A to B and also at level C to D. This is very similar to the rate and level at which women are leaving the US uh, in astronomy as well. And so this may has a major impact actually on, on whether all of Australian astronomy can achieve the decade or plan target or indeed 50-50. And so what I did was um, I created workforce models and so I'm used to modelling galaxies and uh, modelling workforces is, is easier than modelling galaxies. And so I'm using the hires, departures, promotions and retirement data that's publicly available. Um, I'm using population data from the decadal plan, midterm review. I take recruitment data from an astronomy job register and the ARC for the fellowships. And then I use retirement data from the Higher Education Research Database and I also take promotions data from the Academy of Science Athena Swan Application Database. That's assuming that the promotions in astronomy are similar to promotions across STEM in Australia. So now the plots on the right here, the top one here shows you what happens if we just keep the status quo in the different levels. 
So different colours, solid lines show you the fraction of women at different levels. And we're not going to achieve our decadal plan target of 33% um, ever with the status quo. So we have to actually do something. And so what do we need to do? Um, I introduced in the models 50-50 retention. Let's say we can stem those details departures. So we do increase the fraction of women. And in fact, at level E, we can then achieve more than the decadal plan target, but we're still pretty low here. This is due to the hiring. The hiring is still unbalanced. If we did 50-50 hires, we can actually achieve that um, decadal plan target 33% by 2045 at all levels. And so some levels actually achieve that quicker than that. And level D is the slowest, and that's due to the departures. If we did 50-50 hires and retention, and I would argue that, you know, we look at out at society, society has 50-50, and we're not drawing from the Australian astronomy pool, we're drawing from the international pool. There's a huge amount of astronomers in the international pool. We're fairly small compared to the international pool of astronomers. There's no reason why we couldn't do 50-50 hires here in Australia. And so if we did 50-50 hires and 50-50 retention, we could achieve that target um, by 2039 at all levels, and we'd achieve 50% women by 2065, and that's just due to the promotion rates as well as the higher rates at those higher levels. If we did affirmative action, so some universities are now doing affirmative action, they're doing female-only hires, and, in fact, the um, Australian um, Equal Opportunity Act actually says that uh, universities and large, other large, large organisations that have a historic um, underrepresentation of women must do affirmative action to correct for this historic underrepresentation. And so, for example, University of Sydney, this is in the Physics and Astronomy Department, um, they've, they've recently made 78% female appointments to level C to E positions. Uh, along with that Equal Opportunity Act requirement. And so if I put that into the models, then we could achieve our 33% target by 2031. So that's just 10 years. We could achieve 50% women by around 2055. So this means that it's achievable to even get to 50% or 30% and um, that, but more action is required. We're not going to achieve that with the status quo. So this is really important. And um, I'm now extending these models to all of STEM in Australia. I can focus on other disciplines as well. Uh, so to achieve that decadal plan target of 50 or 33%, though, we need uh, retention. Retention's hard. Uh, we need exit surveys, and I think we need Australia-wide exit surveys to understand why a larger fraction of women are leaving than men. Uh, we need retention targets, recruitment targets, and then uh, we need mentoring. And this is both general but also for specifically for promotion. And studies, uh, longitudinal studies have shown that women leave um, the physical sciences due to a lack of a, a good work lack of role models with a good work-life balance. So just having role models isn't enough. They actually have to have a good work-life balance. And so their, their work-life balance has to be visible, not hidden. And we tend to just come into work and do our work and go home and not really show our, our you know, family life. That's why I showed you earlier the picture of my two kids in the, in the slide about, um, you know, feeling like we're in a candy shop because it's important to, for women who have a, a good work and family life to actually show that they've got a balance and that they're actually doing it. Okay, so finally, uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the national benefit of the centre. Um, a lot of people think astronomy, you know, aside from understanding our origins uh, and being cool, what's the benefit? But we do have a lot of benefit. And in fact, there are because we're at the cutting edge of telescope technology, we have to build, we have to actually create that technology for our own telescopes. So um, many universities in Australia have their own instrumentation labs and where we're doing, you know, engineering and creation of new technology. That then gets transferred outside astronomy. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, we do a lot of education outreach, and these are big, major national education outreach programs. Um, there's a lot of people in science now who said they got into science because they got inspired by something astronomical, and um, it's, it's picked up easily in the media too, which is great. We have skills and expertise transfer outside astronomy. In fact, we're 
a lot of our young, uh, bright young postdocs and students are going into the data science industry at the moment. And also we're doing our diversity initiatives. We're hoping they'll have a broader impact as well. So um, just a couple of examples of the technologies. So I'm going to talk a bit about the SAMI and HECTA um, technology. So these, these instruments are built uh, at the University of Sydney and the Anglo-Australian Observatory uh, Macquarie and HECTA is currently being built at the moment and they use hexagonal fibres to minimise light loss and they're, they're put on a focal plane of a telescope and then they're moved, shuffled around to uh, the right position so we can observe galaxies. And they've been developing a piezoelectronic robotic positioner for Hector. These used to be done by people plugged into plates. Now, now there's this cool piezoelectronic positioner which vibrates these uh, fibre bundles along the focal plane of the telescope. And then radio astronomy in Australia is has always been at the cutting edge of the world. And uh, so we're, there's a lot of technology uh, has been and can be transferred to different areas. So just two examples. Um, the, the SAMI and Hector instruments with these fibre bundles have been um, in, used in these fibre lanterns, which are now used in communications. Also, the same lab is using um, these fibre spectrographs and tiny versions of them, so miniature fibre spectrographs on robots on farms. So these are solar-powered robots being used on farms with the uh, Horticulture Australia, and they're being used to detect salmonella, so using spectroscopy to detect salmonella and other bacteria on um, green crops like um, spinach and uh, broccoli and other things. And here's another example. So we had our chief investigator, Kath Trott, and uh, former astronomer, Ilana Fien. They took radio astronomy techniques and applied them to medical research, and they, it's allowed them to um, uh, help uh, deliver a startup technology to improve the radiation treatment of cancer patients in, in basically correcting for the breathing of the patient so that the radiation can go directly to the cancer area without um, damaging so much surrounding healthy tissue. And then finally, we have um, nationwide uh, uh, education outreach programs and the aim of these programs is to encourage more students and a diverse range of students into STEM. And these include a telescopes in schools program which targets schools um, that have, a, a, have historically and even up to now have underrepresentation of students at university level. And we're also targeting girls' schools for telescopes in schools. Um, that's had a tremendous success uh, in encouraging girls into science, in particular in physics. And we're currently working on a program called Astro in the Classroom, which we're planning on launching this year uh, to primary school students. And we're targeting students before they form stereotypes, before they form most of their stereotypes. So this is um, really early year primary school students. And to, um, this is based on the curriculum, on teaching the curriculum in um, video, in Zoom um, uh, sort of talks by the astronomers. Uh, we're running an uh, Indigenous work experience program later this year and uh, we're very excited by our virtual reality production which is aiming to teach the, some of the high school curriculum about space and about atoms uh, in, with virtual reality and um, this is going to be, we'll have a big launch when this is completed later this year but we're very excited by it. Okay, and I just want to thank you. And if you're interested in those diversity uh, goals and how we're achieving them, um, please do read my, my papers uh, on this topic. Thank you. So we have questions, Ingrid? No, there are no questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. If anyone's keen and they have a burning question about, I'm sure that Lisa can answer most questions about astronomy, to be honest. You can either put your, use your hand raise or, and I'll let you talk or you can type your question into the Q&A box down the bottom. People might just want to go to some TGIF. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is Friday afternoon. No, it looks like you've answered everybody's questions and they're all now <laughs> clued up on what Astro 3 G is doing and how galaxies evolve and change over time. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Lisa, for your time. Um, we will put this, it is being recorded, even though Facebook Live wouldn't 
talk to Zoom, that's okay, because what we'll do is we'll um, put that recording for everyone up onto our YouTube channel and then put that link onto um, our social media channels. So um, if you enjoyed this talk, keep an eye on those and we will have that up for you shortly um, and you can share that with your friends. Um, thank you so much, Lisa, for your time. Um, I always find it really interesting uh, learning about what we're doing. I think I learn something new every time because I'm not an astrophysicist, despite the stars on my shirt. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. And, um, you know, it just makes me very proud to be working for a place like a Centre of Excellence and Astro 3D when you see not only the great science we're doing but also the great diversity measures and culture improvement things we have in place and also our education outreach programs inspiring for the public and young people. So thank you so much for your talk and delivering it in a way that um, made it really interesting for everyone. Thank you.